All right, uh, howdy everyone. So this is my makeup session for our March 8th meeting that I'm not gonna be able to make. Um, that So that's the meeting right before our exam. And of course, I'm not gonna leave y'all hanging. Uh, I still have the practice exam. Uh, that's what we're gonna go over today. Um, I actually have a few things that I wanted to talk about. So I'm gonna start screen sharing uh, from my laptop. Oh. oh. Oh, yeah. So um, this is what we'll be talking about today. First, I've been asked a few times like how I would suggest studying for the exam. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll go over the practice exam. I would highly suggest that you do it before watching this video um, just so you can practice like pacing yourself for the exam and also um, get a fresh look at the questions like as you're answering them. Uh, and then final notes at the end if I if I have any. Uh, yeah. So. How you study for this exam, um, I've been asked this a few times, and it's of course it's very subjective, right? Like I'm assuming most of us have uh, studying habits or studying routines that we've kind of developed over the years, like in high school and um, in college. Uh, so of course, like you shouldn't, you should take my advice with a grain of salt. Um, that being said, I believe the most effective way of learning. Uh, especially cellular respiration and photosynthesis, looking at things from a very like top-down uh, perspective. For example, if we're talking about photosynthesis, um, I believe it's useful like looking at the bigger picture, like maybe starting with the purpose of each of the, the reactions, for example, like the Calvin cycle versus the light-dependent reaction, um, like how photosynthesis regenerates high energy molecules that are shuffled into the Calvin cycle to produce um, like G3P, right? So that's the purpose of each of the reactions. And then once you kind of got that down, uh, you start moving into, uh, you know, where these high energy molecules enter the Calvin cycle and then, um, you know, how uh, the electron transport chain and the light dependent reaction works, stuff like that. So you get what I'm saying. Start at a uh, very low level detail, but kind of a uh, broader, broader idea, and then start moving into uh, the details and then learning it that way. That's how I would suggest. Of course, if you don't want to start a new studying habit like a week before the exam, I totally understand that. But just keep that in the back of your mind. If you think it works and if it does work for you, give it a try. Right. Uh, okay, cool. So I'm going to check that this is still recording. And then now we're going to go over the practice, practice exam. Cool, cool. Yeah, so I, I like my main computer recording, my laptop like screen sharing, and then my iPad like airplaying to it. It's, it's like su more, way more complicated than I thought, like trying to set this up. Um, and that might be my fault, but here we are. So which of the following statements best describes the relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration? So the answer is going to be photosynthesis stores energy in complex organic molecules, while cellular respira uh, respiration releases energy from complex organic molecules. Um, yeah, so this is this is the answer. Uh, photosynthesis storing energy in complex organic molecules basically um, what we're hinting at is the production of G3P through the Kelvin cycle. That's going to be shuffled into cellular respiration, uh, probably like in the middle of glycolysis. And then that's going to be oxidized and turned into uh, more energy. While uh, uh, cellular respiration is more so taking a sugar or whatever intermediate you start with, completely oxidizing it, um, and then getting energy from that. Uh, any and I'll, I'll I'll try to go through some of the answer choices and single out some that might trip you up. Um, C is reversed. Uh, photosynthesis is more so like building up uh, organic molecules like G three P. Uh, cellular respiration is catabolic. We're continually oxidizing those high energy uh, organic molecules like glucose uh, to yield energy from that uh yeah cool so number two uh blank is a regulatory mechanism in which the end product of a metabolic pathway inhibits an enzyme that catalyzes an earlier step in the pathway this is a classic example of feedback inhibition 
Um, you know, a way you would see this on the exam is let's say you have substrate A, substrate B, substrate C with enzymes one and enzymes two uh, catalyzing these reactions. The presence of C in a feedback inhibition situation, it would look like this. Oh, no, 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 no. It would not look like that. It would look like this. Um, basically, the presence of C can actually act as a signaling molecule for uh, enzyme one or even enzyme two. Uh, basically, if we're talking about it, let's say like a ATP, it's a high energy molecule that can actually go back and block the function of a glycolysis enzyme called phosphofructokinase and blocking that function basically stops energy from being made. The, the purpose of this is if you're in a high energy state, uh, which is signaled by the abundance of ATP, right? High energy, high ATP, your body doesn't necessarily need to continually oxidize these glucose molecules that are coming in because um, that in itself is a waste of energy, right? We invest ATP to go through glycolysis. Well, if we don't really need the energy right now, there's no reason to make that investment um, in the end. So uh, uh, substrate C in this situation right here is going to block phosphofructokinase to stop glycolysis from occurring or at least slow it down so that our bodies don't waste energy. Uh, yeah. Question three, the light reactions of photosynthesis supply the Calvin cycle with ATP and NADPH. Basically how this works, if we do light reaction and Calvin, basically these two reactions are in um, sort of a cycle, right? The purpose of the light reaction is to convert high energy, um, not sorry, the purpose of the light reaction is to take light energy from the sun or some artificial light source and turn it into chemical energy in the form of electron carriers such as NADPH and ATP, right? And then these high energy molecules are shuffled into the Calvin cycle where um, they're used to take carbon structures um, and reduce them into high energy molecules like G3P that can be shuffled into cellular respiration. Um, this process requires energy. So it's going to use the energy in the form of ATP and NADPH from the light reactions and then consume the energy in them forming ADP and NADP plus, and then shuffle those right back to the light reactions. So you can kind of see the loop that it's making um, and how these reactions are, are usually talked about in conjunction. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the answer to three. Uh, I don't think any of the other answers look that appealing. Uh, then again, like if, if you have a question on one of these questions about why a certain answer choice is wrong, please, please email me. I'll be there on Monday and Wednesday uh, to answer questions. I'll also have my email open, of course. I'll be answering questions all week, even uh, after, after I leave. Um, yeah, yeah, let's keep going. So four, which process is most directly driven by light energy? Um, and that's going to be the transfer of energy from pigment molecule to pigment molecule. Um, what this looks like is, let's say this is the electron transport chain uh, in, in plants. I'm not going to draw the individual complexes and stuff. This is the ATP synthase. <laughs> okay, anyways, uh, so electrons are going to go into the photosystem too from, from water. And then light energy hits it. And then that's what excites the electrons to move them in uh, through the electron transport chain, right? So this is what light energy does. It doesn't most directly into uh, allow like ATP synthesis to happen, even though that is uh, more indirectly true, right? The movement of these electrons through the ETC will still pump hydrogens into the thylakoid uh, um, lumen. And then once they go back out in a very similar way to like, uh, cellular respiration electron transport chain that's going to produce ATPs through the uh, electrochemical gradient. Um, but that's not a very direct way that uh, light energy is used, which is part of the question. Uh, so yeah, C is going to be the best answer. Five, we have a, um, a dilution, or not a dilution question, uh, um, osmosis question. 
Uh, so two, uh, the solutions in the two arms of this U-tube are separated by a membrane that is permeable to water and glucose, but not sucrose. Uh, side A is half filled with a solution of two molar glucose or sucrose and one molar glucose. And then the other side is basically the opposite. Um, so initially the levels on both sides are equal. So basically what's going to happen? Well, the first thing that we should notice is that um, because glucose is permeable to this little uh, thing in the middle, we can assume that the glucose concentrations will stabilize by the glucose is moving across that barrier. So in a way, at the end of this, if we give it time, it'll likely be 1.5 molar glucose on both sides, right? So that wouldn't cause any water shifts, uh, water level shifts in the U-tube. Um, the the movement of water will likely be caused by sucrose because that itself is impermeable to uh, the membrane that we have in the middle of the U-tube. So what's going to happen? Basically, because there's a higher concentration on the A side and we can't move it across to the B side, there's going to be an influx of water into the A side to compensate for that higher concentration, right? If we have high levels of sucrose and normal level of water versus low level of sucrose and normal level of water, it's basically going to stay this. It's it's going to be the, the water levels are going to be balanced, but there's not going to be a balance in concentration of substrates um, or just of molecules. However, if we move water into the higher concentration side, there's going to be fewer sucroses to water molecules. And that's a kind of fancy way of saying there's going to be a lower concentration of sucrose relative to water in the A side if water moves into the A side. And that's exactly what we're going to see. To, to equalize those concentrations, water is going to move from side B to side A. And that is, uh, the end result of that is what A, I, I, answer choice A is talking about. So that's what we're going to go with. Cool. Number six, how does a non-competitive inhibitor decrease the rate of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction? Um, basically, the difference between uh, competitive and non-competitive inhibitors is where the inhibitor binds. Um, for example, active, uh, sorry, not active, uh, competitive inhibitors compete for the active site in an enzyme. Think of it like... On an enzyme, you have a designated spot that a substrate uh, will bind to, um, and that's called the active site, right? Competitive inhibitors will compete for that site by binding to it and then blocking activity by not allowing the substrate to bind to it because it's already there. That's the basis of competitive inhibition. Non-competitive inhibition, instead of the inhibitor binding to the active site, it's going to find somewhere else. And it's usually a designated spot. It doesn't just randomly attach to the enzyme, but it's going to find a designated spot on the enzyme other than the active site, um, bind there, and then inhibit the activity of the enzyme that way. So, uh, yeah, that's that's basically what we're talking about in D uh, by binding to an allosteric site. Allosteric sites are basically any site other than the active site. Um, that, you know, has some key functionality, in this case, uh, binding inhibitors. So uh, by binding to an allosteric site, thus changing the shape of the active site of the enzyme, uh, the shape of the active site changes, um, and that's what causes the substrate to not be able to bind. What we see in biology is that the shape of things highly dictate what happens, dictates function, stuff like that. Um, and this case, and in this case, the substrate won't be able to bind and the enzyme won't be able to perform whatever function that it does. Cool. So in humans, which of the following metabolic processes normally occurs regardless of whether or not oxygen is present? Um, and then where does it occur? So it's going to be glycolysis. Uh, and that's going to happen in the cytosol. Um, and I do have lactate fermentation on here, uh, whether or not O2 is present. Wait. 
Okay, firstly, oxidative phosphorylation that requires um, oxygen to occur because that's what's going to be our final electron acceptor. If there's nothing to accept that electron, it just it just won't occur. Um, okay, so lactate fermentation and ethanol fermentation are incorrect here because they usually occur in the absence of oxygen. If an organism is capable of doing both, like a facultative anaerobe or a facultative aerobe, um, it's going to prefer the oxygenic pathway over the non-oxygenic pathway. For example, it would rather go pyruvate oxidation, TCA cycle, and then electron transport chain rather than fermentation, right? So given the choice, it would rather go that path. Um, however, fermentation kind of kicks in whenever you're in a low oxygen state and, you know, you need to recycle the substrates that go into glycolysis so you can produce energy very inefficiently, um, but, you know, still producing energy uh, through the process of glycolysis. So that would usually not occur regardless of whether or not oxygen is present. Fermentation will usually occur whenever um, there's a low level of oxygen. Glycolysis, however, is always going to happen taking like whatever sugar you start with uh, and turning it into pyruvates for pyruvate oxidation. That occurs whether or not oxygen is present or not. Cool. Question eight, Gaucher's disease, blah, blah, blah. You can read that on your own. Um, but the main point I'm talking about is uh, deficiency of an enzyme necessary for the breakdown of lipids. So if we look at our answer choices, lysosomes are going to be the best answer because uh, if if we recall what lysosomes function, uh, what their functions are, is that usually it's, there are organelles that have, um, you know, a lot of enzymes in them that uh, break down certain things uh, that they get through like different types of phagocytosis or, you know, just like, just things that the cells digest or, or even make themselves and just like send to the lysosome for destruction. Um, since we're talking about the deficiency of an enzyme necessary for breakdown, lysosomes are gonna be the, the right answer here. Question nine. Uh, so use the following information to answer uh, the questions below. And then I give you two charts measuring, um, both the dependent variable in both of these is the function of the enzyme, which is uh, um, represented by the rate of reaction. So we're using rate of reaction as a proxy to measure the function of the enzyme. Um, and what we're manipulating is the temperature of the reaction. So right now, or in the question, I'm asking you which enzyme is located in the stomach, right? So we know that it's highly acidic, um, meaning there's going to be a lower pH, right? So we'll start with the easier one. This chart down here shows us the function of certain enzymes, um, you know, at different pHs, right? Because we're going to be in a very acidic condition, we're going to have a lower pH. So this chart, sorry, this, no. this chart right here that shows us uh, a higher level of function, the highest level of function at pH two is probably going to be a characteristic of the enzyme we're talking about that functions in the stomach, rather than a higher pH of um, peak eight, which would be found elsewhere. So we're going to write four next to this one, and then we're going to look up here and look at the temperature chart. Basically, curves one, two, and three show optimal enzy uh, enzymatic uh, functionality at uh, different temperatures, number one being about 37 degrees Celsius. And what we know about the human body is that our internal temperature kind of stays around 37 degrees. Um, you know, anything higher or anything lower can be really, really bad for, uh, you know, basically how our, uh, how our bodies function. Um, and then enzymes two and three show what, like 55 and then like 75 degrees Celsius. Those are really hot for our bodies um, and you know, regardless of where you are in the body, whether or not if you're in the stomach or in the brain, uh, those temperatures are not gonna be optimal for uh, any, any function in our bodies. So what we're gonna see is graph 
or curve one being uh, the, the optimal for the one we're describing. Yeah, so curves one and four are going to be the characteristics of the enzyme that we're looking for uh, that's located in the stomach. I'm going to quickly check that it's still recording. I'm so like, I need to do this in one run. So I don't want to like have to stitch anything together later. Cool. So uh, most CO2 from catabolism is released during the citric acid cycle. Um, if you know the entire like cellular respiration pathway, which is a, a catabolic pathway for the most part, um, you know that we also release one CO2 uh, during pyruvate oxidation, um, given one pyruvate. Uh, but given one acetyl-CoA, which is uh, derived from one pyruvate uh, during that pyruvate oxidation, we know that one acetyl-CoA yields two CO2 per cycle of the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. Um, that was a lot of words, so I'll just write it down here. TCA, which is this, yields two CO2 per acetyl-CoA. And then pyruvate oxidation yields one CO2 per pyruvate. Um, and then these two kind of go hand in hand because we each get two acetyl-CoAs and two pyruvates from glycolysis or uh, from, from the oxidation of one uh, glucose molecule. Cool. So citric acid cycle is a good answer there. Anyways, uh, which of the following statements is a logical consequence of the second law of thermodynamics? Uh, each chemical reaction in an organism must increase the total entropy of the universe. That's straight up from the uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, use the following to answer the question. Um, so... What we're looking at here, the graph that's shown here is the um, the photosynthetic action spectrum of a regular plant, right? So what we can kind of look at from here is absorbance in solid black and then rate of photosynthesis in dashed, in the dashed line, right? Um, what's What's being shown here is these wavelengths of light on the far ends uh, kind of like wavelength 440 and wavelength 660. These are being absorbed by the photosynthetic pigments that we see in regular green algae, right? So those are not going to be reflected. And instead, the things that don't absorb well uh, in this area over here, um, those things are going to reflect, or these wavelengths of light are going to be reflected by our photosynthetic pigments or our pigment molecules. And then that's what we're gonna see. So that's why they're green. Um, because these lights are being reflected, they end up showing up as green. However, in the question here, I'm saying that the halobacterium that um that we're you know that we're talking about in the question is the inverse of the action spectrum for the graph that we see here. Basically, what that means is this graph for halobacteriums is going to look like, uh, we'll just do like absorbance. It's going to look like this, right? And then we're going to see our peak at about 550, which is the wavelength for green and yellow. Um, and then the question is asking, what wavelengths of light do the halobacterium photosynthetic pigments absorb? Because it is the opposite of green algae or green plants, uh, green photosynthetic plants, they're going to absorb what the green ones were reflecting or yeah, reflecting, um, not absorbing. Um, and that's going to be green and yellow. So the answer we see here is going to be green and yellow. Cool. When electrons flow along the electron transport chain of mitochondria, which of the following changes occurs? So basically if we draw out like we'll draw two complexes, right? As, um, and then I should label it as well, intermitochondrial space and the matrix, right? So 
if we were to say this is complex one, our NADHs are dropping off electrons at this site, and then they're moving across like this, that movement across the complex is uh, the energy that you get from that is used to pump hydrogens out into the intermembrane space, right? Um, so yeah, that's basically what the question is asking. When electrons flow along the electron transport chain, um, which of the following occurs? So as you're moving these protons or these hydrogen ions into the inter intermembrane space from the matrix, the mitochondrial matrix, that's lower the concentration of hydrogen ions inside of the matrix, right? If we have a lower concentration of, um, if you have a lower concentration of hydrogen ions, that means that it's going to become less acidic, right? Because the concentration is lowering. And then that also means the pH is going to increase. It's going to become more basic. So that's what the answer is for question 13. Yeah. Uh, which of the following sequences best describes the path by which electrons travel downhill uh, in aerobic respiration? Ignore that 27. Um, yeah, so in aerobic respiration uh, in humans, we know that oxygen, um, well, firstly, we're starting with glucose or food, right? So that's that's going to be the same in all the questions. But we can go immediately to the end of each of the answers and you know kind of cross off based off of that. We know that in aerobic respiration, diatomic oxygen O2 is going to be the final electron acceptor at the very end of the electron transport chain, right? Um, and we know that ATP is not the right answer because that's not where our electrons go. The electrons that we get from NADH and FADH2, um, it's just not going to, that's not going to be the molecule that takes our electrons. We know it's going to be oxygen. So we can immediately cross out B and C. And uh, yeah, um, another thing we see is that it's not going to go from glucose to pyruvate. Um, pyruvate is a byproduct of the oxidation of glucose through uh, the process of glycolysis. However, a product that we know from glycolysis is NADH. And what we what we call NADH, I think I've talked about before, is uh, that is in a mobile electron carrier, right? Those NADHs are produced from the reduction of NAD+. Uh, and that's a process that occurs in glycolysis. Um, so basically, NADH is a high energy molecule that has those electrons that are taken to the electron transport chain to move uh, that proton gradient that we see uh, in the mitochondria. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Check it, so recording, cool. Uh, question 15, what will happen to a red blood cell uh, which has an internal ion content of about 0.9% if it is placed into a beaker of pure water? So, Basically, what we'll see is that the cell will swell because the water in the beaker is hypotonic relative to the cytoplasm of the red blood cell. It's, it's really important to know um, when we're talking about tonicity, the what you're comparing, right? So, of course, fresh water or pure water uh, from the question is going to have a lower ion concentration than whatever's inside of a cell, right? So, in this case the water in the beaker is hypotonic, meaning that there's a lower solute concentration uh, relative to the cytoplasm of the red blood cell. If we were to flip it around and say uh, the opposite, we would say the red blood cell is hypertonic relative to the water in the beaker, right? So um, there's a reason she said the tonicity questions are, are typically like a, a breaking point for a lot of students. Um, it's because of the wording. The wording can change in each question, even though the situation is completely the same. So make sure you get the wording right. Um, and then, yeah, because uh, the water in the beaker is hypotonic, the water is going to want to rush into the cell to kind of try to equalize those concentrations. Um, and then that's going to cause the cell to swell because we don't have something like, like a cell wall to, to maintain the stability of, uh, of the red blood cell. Question 16, uh, which of the following statements about enzyme function is true? Uh, the, qu the correct answer is going to be enzymes increase the rate of chemical reactions by lowering activation energy barriers. 
Um, this is true because enzymes don't change the free energy, the change in free energy of reactions. You can't really change that. Um, however, they do make reactions more favorable by um, lowering the energy you would need to input into a reaction to make it proceed uh, if it's non-spontaneous um, or even if it is spontaneous, right? Um, is that true? Maybe not completely. Out of scope right now, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's basically it for that question. 17, which of the following does not occur during the Calvin cycle? Uh, what's not going to occur is the release of oxygen. Release of oxygen is going to be um, something that we see in uh, photosynthesis. Uh, release of oxygen occurs at the start at photosystem two, whenever uh, the electrons are taken off of water. So a water is oxidized uh, to oxygen, diatomic oxygen in the process that takes electrons off of the water and then pumps them into uh, photosystem two to be energized by sunlight or artificial light. Uh, carbon fixation, that's the step one of the Kelvin cycle, regeneration of the CO2 acceptor, that's step three, uh, oxidation of NADPH, I think is in multiple steps, but um, yeah, that's basically it. Definitely in, definitely in step two, because step two creates G3P, um, excuse me, and that process of creating the G3P uh, requires energy, um, and that's going to be supplied in the form of NADPH and the ATP, the oxidation of those. Yeah. Question 18, a flask containing photosynthetic Photosynthetic. Okay, it's recording my voice. I I just, I just got scared that it wasn't recording my voice this whole time. Um, a flask containing photosynthetic green algae and a control flask containing water with no algae are both placed under a blank or a bank of lights that is set to cycle between twelve hours of light and twelve hours of dark. Um, the dissolved oxygen concentrations. Well, you can read it. Um, so basically, I'm talking about algae, photosynthetic algae versus nothing in, uh, in two separate vials, right? So in the presence of light, because it's photosynthetic, it's going to create oxygen from, um, you know, just performing its normal metabolic actions or anabolic actions, stuff like that. Um, so in the Yeah, sorry. So in the in the situation with dissolved oxygen um, in the algae in the algae flask, because it's it's being exposed to light and then twelve hours of dark, the process of photosynthesis during light, the light dependent reaction, is going to produce oxygen uh, from the oxidation of of water, and then that's going to increase the level of oxygen inside of that that uh, little vial, and then um, the dissolved oxygen concentration will be higher. Uh, in the case of the control, uh, there's nothing in there, so it's not it's not supposed to change. Yeah, that's about it for that question. Uh, the first molecules of CO2 from catabolism are released during, um, and I'm assuming it's talking about cellular respiration here, or I'm talking, I wrote it. Uh, it's going to be pyruvate oxidation. Uh, we see one molecule of CO2 being released per pyruvate, uh, pyruvate turning into acetyl-CoA. Um, and then the second molecules of CO2 are going to be released during the TCA cycle. Um, yeah, that's about it. Electron transport chain, lactate fermentation, uh, don't release CO2. But if I said um, Why am I blanking here right now? If I said ethanol fermentation, that actually does release CO2. Um, but that's also conditional because you don't always go through ethanol fermentation. Um, that's why I didn't put it here. It would just be confusing. Uh, yeah. Asbestos is a material, blah, blah, blah. You can read it. Uh, as a result, asbestos fibers will accumulate. So in the first place, they're accumulating because... Um, 
cells take up asbestos by phagocytosis, but can degrade it, right? So they're being endocytosed, but they're not, or they're being, um, they're being brought in through endosymbiosis or not endosymbiosis, uh, like phagocytosis, um, but they can't degrade it, right? So we know that after something is brought in through fusion, um, it's packed into like a vacuole that or um, like a little storage uh, membrane. And then it's brought to lysosomes for degradation, right? Because they're not able to degrade it, there's likely a problem with the lysosomes uh, instead of like a transport system like the Golgi apparatus. Um, proxosomes are more involved with like reactive oxygen species uh, and the, the stabilization of those nuclei is for like genetic material and stuff like that. So lysosomes is going to be our best answer. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the exam. Uh, 20 questions, 25 minutes. Uh, hopefully you were able to finish it in that 25 minutes. Um, if you not def if you or if you weren't able to, uh, definitely work on like pacing or or something like that. Um, yeah, I honestly don't have much to say. I might send out something later on uh, if I remember it, but for the most part, the session uh, session's over. Thank you for watching. If you watch all the way, if you just went through and got the answers, I don't mind that either. Um, good luck on Friday. You guys got it. I, I fully believe all of y'all can succeed on this exam. It's it's a lot of information, um, a bunch of pathways, a bunch of different concepts, but uh, it's it's definitely doable. It's definitely doable. You just got to put the work in. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, I will see you guys on Monday. Thank you.